Hello and welcome to the Festival of the Muses. This live stream is presented by the Center for Hellenic Studies in collaboration with the Isidore Duncan International Institute, the Ecumenical Delphic Union, and the Committee for the Reinstatement of the Delphic Games. I'm Lana Coley, and I'm delighted to introduce the next panel in which you'll meet two contemporary poets whose work takes inspiration from ancient Greek culture. The curator and host for this session is Natasha Bershadsky. Natasha explores interactions of history, myth, and ritual in her research. She is riveted by connections between ancient and modern poetic traditions. She is a lecturer on the classics at Harvard University and a fellow in poetry and in ancient Greek history at the Center for Hellenic, Hellenic Studies, where she co-edits Magnetic Links, a poetry project for the online publication Classical Inquiries. Please enjoy this live edition of Magnetic Links. Uh, hello, everybody. And it is, of course, uh, my joy uh, first uh, to say hello to Carol and to Reg, uh, whom I see the in, uh, in vivo for the first second in my life. So it is a deeply amazing moment of, of this virtual connection. So uh, I could, um, uh, maybe I should, uh, you, you hardly need introductions, uh, but uh, let, me, let me do it uh, anyways. So let me, um, let me read uh, the few words uh, to just start to describe uh, your amazing trajectories and personalities. So Carol Rumens was born in South London and currently lives and works in North Wales where she teaches creative writing at Bangor University. Her most re recent poetry collections are Animal People, Perhaps Bag, and The Mixed Urn of 2019. Her chapbook, Bizdelki, Small Things, illustrated by Emma Wright, won a Michael Marks Award for Best Pamphlet. She's currently working on a sequence of poems exploring and comparing the lives, beliefs, and identities of Welsh and Sufi mystics. And the second star of this conversation is Reginald Gibbons, who co-translated with Charles Seagal, Bakai, and Antigone, and also published uh, Sophocles selected poems, um, odds and fragments. And of course, it goes without saying uh, that he is um, a poet, the author of 10 books of poems and other works, and a Francis Hooper Professor of Arts and Humanities at Northwestern University. So I'm thrilled uh, to uh, welcome you into this house, uh, Cloud House. Um, and uh, for myself, uh, I think I'm going to represent the Greek chorus. So I'll uh, ask, um, questions somehow in, in my general ignorance and uh, I'll provide reactions and in general try to channel connections between you and uh, the world uh, who is um, enjoying uh, this conversation. So uh, maybe I should just cede the screen to you now. Okay, thank you. I'm really delighted and honoured to have been invited to this festival. Thank you, Natasha and everyone concerned. I'm going to read some poems which uh, uh, relate either to the classical idea of the muses or to the colloquial um, e uh, expression, the muse, as it's used by modern people. And I'm going to begin with uh, Sappho, a poem in which I complain a little bit about the way she's being represented by male tradition. She was a feminist icon, so-called, in, um, in the early 70s when I wrote this poem, um, and we feminist people decided that she had a, a, a more uh, dynamic history. I don't think there's very much scholarly basis for this, but we that there was some theory that she was originally an Amazon. So I'm criticising Ovid and uh, various others in this, in this poem. Sappho. Alcius jewels her icon, violet-haired, holy, sweetly smiling. Ovid's art, defying hers, rings a heroine's heart with lust for Theon. She weeps, she's small and plain, 
One little push, a poet dies again, the dark hair swirling at Lucadia's foot. Some say she milled her bread on sharper stone, entering history with a treacherous Amazonian spear to be the spark from the struck boot sole of the patriarch, to wreck his boat, his nets, to snatch his oars and seize her lovers by an act of choice as treacherous as talent. In delight, Erato smiles, reach high, love women, right. Um, this one is from uh, the, the Federers. It's um, a poem that's uh, about two lovers, Socrates and uh, it's, it's uh, speaking almost, almost of the time. So it's a description of the two lovers walking by the, by the lake or the stream in this, in this case. I wrote it in Regent's Park in London by the lake. Phaedrus. The souls of lovers, said Socrates to his young companion, can complete their wings only by embracing philosophy. The way hard, these friends paddled the stream, arousing a bright complication of water. Through the hot midday, their silvery dialectic shimmered below plain leaves. Summer wings stirring the air, love talked itself to oblivion. They parted, not with a kiss, but a prayer, honouring wisdom. When my mother was a, a young woman, she wanted to be a dancer. And although she didn't fulfill that ambition, I think she was talented and she had hoped very much to pass on the talent to me, but uh, failed completely. And this is a poem I wrote after her death. Um, I imagined her watching a, a very popular TV programme. I don't know if you have it in the USA, but it's, it, it was called Strictly Come Dancing and it was on every Saturday night. And she had arthritis as a, in, in her later life. so. This is a poem that imagines her set free from that. And her name was Marjorie May Lumley, nay Mills. All Souls, Saturday Night. In the corner of my living room, she'll sit watching herself on TV, lost in a vision of mobility which doesn't hurt, or almost doesn't hurt. They said I was cut out to be a dancer. Foxtrot, waltz. Tango, samba, rumba, the glitter balls revolve. A ghost of taffeta holds her, slips her on. Doctors should kill us off when we get to 60. She swims the air with swollen, broken, slippered feet. Her see-through hands drift to unlock the rack of hips. She stands. She's twisting free in the shudder of a beginner's paso doble and steps out partnerless. Who needs a man to kick the glass, glissade into a streaming of stars across space-time to be her own blue heaven? Look, an empty chair. You should have seen me at the Hippodrome. And in my living room, her quick step quickens, lightest among the dancers, and her glance over her shoulder knows I'm watching her somewhere on television. This is a kind of a kind of threnody, which I wrote um, after my partner Yuri uh, died in uh, in 1915, and it uses in image an, uh, a few lines, in fact, from a, from an actual threnody, um, which is quoted in uh, the ritual lament in Greek tradition by Margaret Alexiou. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And it comes from Kurania. So the first three lines are from that, that real uh, threnody. Then it takes off into my more personal uh, poem. And it ends with, with, uh, with another quote, which is um, about uh, depleted uh, uranium. So it um, goes from ancient to modern. Threnody with depleted uranium. My love, I loved you well, I kept you well. I kept you as musk in the box and as wire in the reed. I kept you as a silver lamp which lit up this home. On the day when our fingers and lips were broken mirrors, I stayed in the kitchen, though I wanted to see as they packed you in a long bag. They wheeled you past me, then they hid you in a long box of pale oak. 
and out of the flames they brought me a little salt in a cardboard tube printed with pastel flowers. I keep your arms and shoulders in a wardrobe of old sweatshirts. Your feet are wrapped around mine as I walk in your shoes. Your head moves shyly in small photographs. I will send you into space to flirt among girlish moons. I will bury you in a mine as deep as the nights when I think the words never and not ever. My hand passes through concrete and brings out mud and ash and the intermittent sparks of atomic decay. I will keep you well, Uranus, my silver-suited darkness, and live with your death unburied at my core as the planet lives with the half-life of a great metal that creates deadly hazards when used in anger. And this one's spoken by, I, I think I'd almost say every poet. It's, it's, a, it's a poet in later life remembering his, I think it's a, it might be his or her uh, previous lovers. It's called uh, Danai Dinari. And it begins with a quote again from the Thedras, as wolves love la lambs, so lovers love their loves. Socrates. The pursuit of immortality, bragged the poet, was nothing. I was young and showered with starry faces. Not divinities, he said. These were people, boys, girls, much alike, just people. The same lizard brains, the same jack hearts, the same unbeatable value profiles, lips shopping around for kisses. They've crumpled now, he said. They smiled too much, got scaly or soft but the originals pocketed at the moment when the mouth which mine had touched sang from the fire are hard and fine and sovereign. Savings, he grinned, poet's currency. And this one is um, back, back to uh, Ovid again. It's a, a, a a rather rough translation. I have changed the, the, um, the, the end of the poem a little bit, as you'll know. It's from book three of Fasti, so it's set in, in the month of, of March. The Grape Picker. By the fifth morning, when the dew had dried on the saffron cheek of Tithona's wife, Aurora, instead of the great bear and the sleepy herdsman, you'll see the grape picker, curly-haired and palest, stretch out his boyish hand. This is his story. Child of nymph and satyr, he was playing among the Ismanian hills one day when Bacchus, idly watching, fell for him utterly. He sang up a drunken gift, an enormous vine, fruit laden, and trailed it over the highest bough of an elm tree. Scrambling along to reach the glowing clusters, and Pelis lost his balance, pitched over head first. Bacchus lifted the small corpse from the hillside. He placed it in a canopy of swaying grape bright stars. Mm. Uh, I'll just check. I think this is the last poem I'm going to read in this um, in this section. Yes, it is. So I'll end with this one which is called England to her maker. And I've imagined England as a kind of um, white collar worker, sort of executive, talking to uh, a factory worker. Um, but I've cast the uh, manual worker as, as Hephaestus. So it's England to her maker. Hephaestus, we tried to tell you the signs were everywhere. You kept your head down face to the glare, hammering, beveling, punching, all that noise and smoke. No wonder you didn't hear. You were wreathed in the heat and darkness of your craft, never stood upright except to hammer our silences with ringing cries of grievance peculiar to your class. Eyes clearer than yours, Hephaestus, were noting the lack of new orders. We don't deny you had skills. You armed the fighting gods, invented such curiosities as the self-propelling tripod, the fire-breathing bronze ball, magnificent, 
Yeah, not exactly what life's about anymore. We have microchips, we have genuine automation, quiet machines that can reason. Unlike your rough irons, clanking brainlessly, filthily, think of your lungs, black as the grass round here, your legs bowed under you like pliers. You could have a job sitting down, somewhere cool and well lit, where there's music, plants, fountains. Imagine yourself with white cuffs, tapping a keyboard, smiling, taking credit cards only, smiling. It's the future. You can't fight the future. You can't argue with progress, Hephaestus. Look at it this way. Thanks. So that's where I'll end. Thank you for listening. That, that was lovely, Carol. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Very. I'm going to start by, <laughs> maybe I'll end up finishing by detouring to ancient Greece through Asaph Mandelstam, the Russian poet. Uh, why is that? Uh, I've been translating a lot of Russian poetry over the last few years with a friend, a Russian poet, Ilya Kutik. And um, I learned a lot and I, I found a line in Mandelstam that explained to me what it was that was exciting me um, artistically. This is, these are two lines. This is a translation by uh, Richard Elizabeth McCain from years ago of one of Mandelstam's poems. But in, in the first stanza, he says, I want to go outside our language because of everything that ties me to it forever, which is a kind of a very diagnostic paradox for um, his work. And that's, that's really been my life as a translator, looking outside English in order to add um, capacities to what I could do in English by learning poetics of other languages. And um, Russian poetry is so different from English language poetry that there's a lot to learn there. So I'm going to read a few poems that um, all have images pulled out of Mandelstam. And in the case of the last one, it's just a translation. It's just, it's a, my way of translating a poem in it with every detail that it has. He has uh, poems, a couple of poems at least, in which he mentions the uh, Aya Sophia uh, <clears throat> and uh, he does interesting things with it imagistically. And this begins with um, altering his image. I'll come back to that image though in another poem. The cranium dome hangs from its own thread of virtual pale light, conceiving its exercises of inventiveness, its own associative super supremo conductivity its color wheel of lucid and lulu, its murk and murder, worthy and woo-woo heterodoxies, its Zeno, its Zeus, its Dante, its te deums and freak shows, frescoes, twine theory, money, bread, bricks, wine, sex, six syllable abstractions, axes, and genetic ingenuities of custom, including kisses, grammar, the vertical graves of men buried upside down without their heads. This is a, another one, shorter. Mandelstam's Greek bees turned the honey back into sun. We too head toward reverses, leaves transforming their orange into green. Don't shores erode the seas? Don't riverbanks flow upstream? Aren't wounds caused by blood? Don't stars produce the night? And doesn't extinction vivify the newborn? 
Don't dreams produce our dulled sleeplessness? I'll come back to the Greek bees at the end. Here's the uh, Saint Sophie, the Hagia Sophia image from his poem. It's so wisely that the dome of Hagia Sophia hangs from heaven on gold chain, and that a nib, bright platinum of the Greek mountain home of poetry, floats upward higher than snow clouds and spills the ink well of song into rivers, lakes, harbors, straits. The filled footprints of winter beliefs, summer convictions, pleasure and pain that's immeasurably old. And neither nor, gold, lead, true, untrue. This is uh, what I imagine to be Mandelstam's monologue on the barren waste of a trash heap uh, somewhere near Vladivostok before he died. And some of these images and lines are taken from his poems. Um, one of Carol's images actually resonates with mine or vice versa. Those, uh, that night sky image you had um, mine is from him, Silver Galaxies of Cold Candle Wax, but that's very Mandelstamian. <clears throat> Can't keep up with fierce, accelerating, honey-sweet songs that call to so much in me. Can't feel it all fast enough. Half can't breathe when I try to. The scale of the real is this, each life so vast, but easy as a blossom to crush. Pavilions of outflying nebulae, silver galaxies of cold candle wax, hang suspended like whole cities stolen from earth and floating only a thousand miles up. No, that likeness is as feeble as an amoeba. What of the epic length slipping of all the human tongues that have ever spoken? Didn't they always say more than was meant? What of the silent deafening waterfall of all our longing since forever? And in the clumps of fire yellow on the busybody back legs of a bumblebee, each single grain of pollen, a world, and in the best of the thousand cities on each grain, someone's chanting another Iliad. Sing, goddess. Um, now this one, I've got the wrong one marked here. Here we go. This one is titled, th those don't have titles. The whole sequence is called Dark Honey. This one is titled Persephone. And it came out years and years later. It came out of a moment I remembered uh, when I was on Crete in the 1980s, um, roaming around. The Cretan sky is too bright for human eyes. Near the empty road on gust beaten highlands, an old stone windmill abandoned without veins, defends like a ghost fortress of memory, all the depopulated myths and history here and in the sea. Gone into the past tense that time perfects. Here's a chance for us. We can elude the way our usual hours saturated 
by so much we did not want to be ours. The black opening of a missing door calls us in. For a moment, for a buzzing moment, we see very little. Dark scent of honey, faint from acacia and flowering thyme. Thin gold blades of sky, piercing gaps of lost mortar. A bee swarm, growling, drowsy, is swaying in the air, far from sweet sources. Swarm of a goddess, deathless refugee, one who long ago abandoned her bees. Interhovering, droning with choral voice there, Sephone, Sephone. Confused with them, we understand them, still mourning their lost one, their lost all. And who or what will come to warrant her existence now? Word sounds that want to think their way forward, interweaving and hovering, humming, almost resolve in our, in our ears. The windmill, abyss of wonder, filled with our dizzy longing to see, to have back, Sephone, life-wise, those we have lost, those we will lose. But we are alive. Let me kiss you now. And this is the translation of a poem that's been much translated by Mandelstam. But again, he goes to Greece also. Natasha has translated this one. My version, for your sweet joy, take from my cupped hands a little glittering of sun, a little honey, for this is what Persephone's own bees commanded. A boat can't cast off if it isn't moored. No one can hear a shadow that wears fur boots. We can't best our fear in this dark wood. Our kisses, these are all that we can save, velvety as bees, which die if they are exiled from the hive. They're murmuring in the translucent groves of night. The far wilds of mountain Greece are their native land. Their diet is time. Lungwort, pale meadow sweet. For joy, please take this pagan gift, this rude rustling necklace of bees that have died. For these had transmuted honey into sun. And I should say that one of the things that's most interested me in Mandelstam and in Russian poetry generally. Uh, at least of the 20th century, <clears throat> is uh, apophatic thinking, apophatic images, images of what's invisible, impossible, uh, um, unseeable, well, that's invisible, unhearable, any sort of an, un, an emptiness that is a something. Um, and of course, uh, when I wrote about uh, apophatic poetics, uh, a couple of essays that appeared in literary magazines, and then there were in my book called How Poems Think. Um, I'm not sure that that wasn't the only essay ever been written about apophatic poetics for poets. I mean, for poets and readers, not, not theologians. Um, but I managed to find a few poems in English that were quite illustrative, uh, off the beaten track. And... Um, I learned so much, uh, it took me a long time, by, uh, l by practicing, before I even could feel it or understand it, the apophatic image, working off of Mandelstam often, because um, he, he does this a lot. So um, these images that are his, I mean, uh, you can't cast a boat off from a the shore or a dock if it isn't already moored. So, 
and and uh, then the double one, you know, no one can hear a shadow, first of all, but then he says that wears fur, which of course it can't. Um, and he does things like that all the time. So those sort of, um, again, to go back to the, uh, the quote I started with, um, I want to go outside our language because of everything that ties me to it forever. And I often explain when I teach poetry now to students that the imagery they use is extremely uh, English language mind. That's a three word hyphenation. You know, it's English loves naming English. So does Greek, but um, English loves naming and concreteness and distinction and, uh, you know, we have more names for species than some other languages, modern languages do. I mean, I'm leaving aside Latin. I'm not, I don't mean scientific names, but just bird names, for example, or blue or, or, or flower names. In Coleridge's notebooks, there's a page. I wrote a poem out of it a hundred years ago. There's a page, an entire page covered with the names of wildflowers beginning with the letter B, only B. He never got any further. Um, that's English. But then there's something about the apophatic that opens a space for a kind of feeling or a kind of feeling hyphen thought that I find very, very interesting. And of course, I should finish by saying this. Um, that all comes from Greek. <laughs> that's the Eastern, that's the Eastern Church, that's Orthodox. Theology. My, my co-translator, the poet Ilya Kukti, said to me just recently, we were working on an image. He said, he said, no, I need to explain to you. If you go to the icon to kiss the icon on the, on the iconostasis and the icon's missing, it burned in a fire, someone stole it, whatever. It makes no difference. The image is not the icon. It's what you go through, the frame, to something that can't be imagined. That's the icon. So... I found that poetically and existentially a tremendously interesting uh, little poetic power to half acquire. Now I should stop talking. Uh, do you want to ask us things, Natasha? Uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so I thank you so much for this beautiful readings. And I'm delighted that we dove so deeply, so quickly, so um let me think uh let me let me see what uh what would be maybe not even yet a question but uh a reaction so i was thinking about um dear reg about what he was saying about apophatic poetry so the poetry the poetry that um says something by negation that uh just an utterance uh, that is negating itself and um uh, of course, um, what very sort of basic um, cognitive science tells us is that uh, the negative signifier, so it's George Lakoff, the famous ling linguist, who is saying that you cannot invoke a signifier, even a neg negated signifier is still made present in the mind of the audience. So whenever you uh, say it, it's not X, then X just blossoms uh, inside your imagination. And uh, I love, um, so I think one of the um, common threads uh, that I see in both uh, your poetry and uh, Carol's uh, poetry is that um, there is this multiplicity of uh, universes which which are invoked. And I think maybe it, it has something to do with um, the ability to both negate things and make it vividly present uh, in one's imagination. So maybe, maybe this will be my first uh, reaction. I think it's very, it's, it was wonderful reading, by the way, original. It was really terrific, very moving and beautiful. Um, yes, I think I, 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 I'm new to that idea, but I think it's relevant to the material I'm writing now about the mystics, 
because at the center of that is something unseeable and, and unknowable. So I, I just want to react by saying how I appreciate think, being made to think about that in greater depth. Mm. In, in my book, How Poems Think, I also have a chapter about what most poets nowadays and, uh, and, and readers think must be a very modern idea, which is that uh, there's so much that can't be expressed. Language doesn't have the ability, anybody's language, whatever one, does not have the ability to express everything. And so there's, there are whole schools of poetry built on the inexpressible. Uh, you find ways to supposedly to fracture language or to, or to turn it in different ways so that in between the words, something comes that is inexpressible. But, you know, this goes all the way back to had I a, a, a ten tongues, had I a hundred mouths, I could not say, you know, I could not describe that army on the plane. Um, in, in the, um, and that's also a kind of um, sort of concrete absentness, as well mm -hmm. as the absence of that which can't even be said to exist materially. There's also even material things can be described in a way that conveys how un- finally, you know, non-thinkable they are. I mean, I'm thinking now the beginning of Sappho's poem too, you know, some say an army, some say ships. It's, in, it's indescribably, incredibly amazing, but guess what's even more amazing and tiny by comparison, you know, on Octoria. So I, I love trying to acquire these um, places to stand within in my own language that are not in, in some way, just simply because of what speakers have chosen to say and poets have chosen to do. It's not sort of native. Mm -hmm. you know, but you're not a min so, sorry, go on. This is, this is the last time I was gonna say, Rossetti wrote a preface to his Italian poets uh, translations. And he said, the only purpose of translation, this may sound very belletristic, but really it's deeper. The only point of making a translation of a poem is to, he says, to bring some beauty into the language which it doesn't, the, the target language which it doesn't have yet. But it's much deeper than something pretty, you know, much deeper. That's all I wanted to add. Mm -hmm. uh, no, what I was going to say was um, that your poetry is very rich linguistically and, and so, some poet might decide to go the other route in order to, in order to express the ineffable and, and write very barely. But it's interesting that you made a sort of paradoxical decision in a well, way. Well, Ceylon is very minimal that way too. And he's, yes, always, yeah. he's always trying to get hold of something which, for which the, he simply doesn't have words. And he basically mm -hmm. he's sort of illustrating with his own work how there aren't words for some things, not, not, not completely adequate words, shall we say. Yeah. Yeah, so I agree. It, there are a lot of ways to come at it. I, um, I'm thinking about uh, the etymology of the word muse, Musa. So uh, according to Gregory Nash, it comes from the verb muo, um, and uh, this verb can be translated depending on the context, either silent in a ritually appropriate way or making a ritually appropriate utterance. So, um, and I think that immediately connects poetry in the Greek uh, imagination to this whole question of um, ritual and initiation and uh, things that are absolutely crucial, but absolutely must to be left unsaid whenever the ritual situation is not, like the context is not correct. So, uh, Yes, I agree. There are different degrees of un, of the unsayable. Mm. There are different sort of uh, exemplars or species of what's unsayable, which mm. can be addressed with different kinds of language or with language beautifully arranged so that what it says is you can't say this. <laughs> um, Maybe uh, and then the censorship kind of unsayableness as well. Uh, Carol, could could you say it again? Because I am afraid I, I interrupted. 
Oh, no, I was just going off at a bit of a tangent and saying censorship. There was that aspect of the unsayable, where mm. politically it was unsayable, or socially. That was all, yeah. just adding that. There's a little prose piece by Daniel Karms, the Russian early 20th century writer who had a very sad end, of course. But he has a little, he has a funny little piece. He starts to describe a person and, and then ends up saying everything that that person is not, every physical characteristic is negated. And when you get to the end of it, it's only a long paragraph, a medium length paragraph. You realize that what he's saying is, but he can't say it because of censorship. Yeah. This person has been arrested and taken away will never be seen again. Yeah. But what he does it with is by negating every, doesn't have red hair, doesn't have this, isn't that way, isn't this way. Yeah. And then you, you you sort of pick it up, but he comes out yeah. and yeah. from the other side without having even to say what he's not allowed to say, which is this person was arrested or even there's censorship, which would prevent me from publishing this or get me killed if I did publish it. Yeah. As a, as a straightforward description. Mm -hmm. Wow, I actually never, I uh, I know very well this uh, little, I don't know, um, that poem, prose poem of, of Harms, and actually it never occurred to me that it would be connected to censorship, but it, it makes total sense. But there is, like there are all this nexuses uh, between the, external and then of course his internal uh interest in magic and uh there this uh, sort of just phenomenon of disappearance so uh, i can uh, i can see how they just come together in the most uh uh uncanny yeah there are probably at least uh, three different ways to read it but <laughs> my, my understanding of it after i read it a number of times was oh oh Oh, I see. There's this other thing too, of course, because he himself, he himself ended up being killed, didn't he? <clears throat> yes, yes. And yeah. there is this beautiful poem about a person who, of his, uh, about a person who is just leaving the house with uh, a little oh. uh, bag on his shoulder and disappearing, never to come again. So. Uh, but maybe should we return to the figure of uh, Mandelstam? And of course, uh, Mandelstam is one of the threads which um, holds together uh, our current weaving because uh, the poems uh, of uh, both Carol and Reg, uh, which we were lucky to fortunate to publish in the magnetic li uh, links were both sort of refraction, ref reflection of Mandelstam's poetry. So uh, I'm just um, very interested in this double connection because they were refractions of Mandelstam poetry, which is already refracting uh, ancient Greek uh, material. So what is Mandelstam and Mandelstam's Greece for either of you? Carol? Uh, I don't really know. I, d I don't think I can answer that. I only see Mandelstam's gr Greece uh, darkly, I think, because I don't, I don't know Russian very well. So um, I would say I found out more about his Armenia than his Greece because I read mm. his, um, his essay about that. Yeah. So I have to pass on that one, I think. Well, you know, I, I found some quotes I wanted to have handy today. So here's one of them. Um, and But you, you had sent me this one, uh, Natasha, when I mentioned it, you found the quote for me. Um, and I found that I had it in another translation, but the one you sent to me was much better, one by Sidney Monas. This is Mandelstam in his essay, The Nature of the Word. And it's a I mean, I'm reading these essays only in English, and they're very difficult to follow in English, so. In Russian, too. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me, in my poetry translation course, I used to assign Walter Benjamin's uh, task of the translator, but I never could really adequately address it myself. Finally, I had a German graduate student. I said, would you do the report on this? She said, yes. She came back the next week. She gave the report, but before she began, she said, having read this in German, she was German. 
having read this in German, and she was a critical theory person, um, I can tell you that it's more difficult to understand in German than it is in English. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I don't assign it anymore. I don't find it useful. I'm not a language mystic. Uh, there's something else I'm trying to talk about, which is not actually being lang a language mystic, but in fact being a, um, someone who wants to be able to evoke what's uh, not quite thinkable, including that which is mystical, but I'm not a mystic myself. I'm interested in the mental experience of encountering what can't be described. Uh, it goes, but you know, and, and I've, it turned out when I began to look at it, of course I knew poems like this. There's St. John of the Cross's poems, which are very apophatic. And uh, I'd studied those as an undergrad as a Spanish major. Anyway, here's the quote from Mandelstam. The Russian language is a Hellenic language. Due to a whole complex of historical conditions, the vital forces of Hellenic culture, which had abandoned the West to Latin influences and which found scant nourishment to prompt them to linger long in childless Byzantium, what a metaphor, rushed to the bosom of Russian speech and communicated it to the self-confident secret of the, communicated to it the self-confident secret of the Hellenic worldview, the secret of free incarnation. And so the Russian language became indeed sounding and speaking flesh. And I had heard this in another version, not so, not Mandelstam's, from Kutik before I knew that Mandelstam had said it, that there's a sense of the Russian word, the word itself, it has a body in a way. And uh, Ilya has explained to me that Russian poets anyway, and readers of poetry can hear what he calls the vertical dimension of a Russian word. It might be an old church Slavonic word that's still used. And so yeah. even though it's an everyday word, it takes somebody back centuries when the word is used. And of course in English, we have no sense of that. It's not, it's not our linguistic culture. Really? I, we have Latin, <laughs> Latin and Greek uh, origins for some of our words, well, Anglo-Saxon. I think some of us understand that there is such a thing as etymology, but Ilya is talking about people who don't have any idea what etymology is. They simply live the word as a word that signifies two different moments in time, their own mm -hmm. and the past, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't think that we do that. Do you? Maybe we do. Maybe I'm just wrong about it. What do you think about that, Carol? I don't know about people in general, but I do try to be myself aware of, of the many layers that go, go into a, a word. Well, I yeah. think we poets, you know, we, we love etymologies. Mm. <laughs> I spend yeah, lots of time do. on them. I, I'm a dictionary reader, you know. Yeah, me too. And, uh, and we we love that kind of thing. But I don't I don't think even all poets are listening that way. No, probably not. You're probably right. I'm not thinking of the modern Greek poets who have oh, so, yeah. like I imagine what Mandelstam would say about them because I was just translating a poem poems of Agathe Dimitruka from Greek and you uh, open like every line of the poem and it goes back 2000 years at the minimum or 2500 uh, years so uh, Greek modern Greek definitely beats mm -hmm. Russian with that sort of sense of Enormous depth. Yeah. 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 And I, I've read a lot of Yanis Ritsos in English, and his poems are filled with apophatic images. But I didn't know that they were. I, I started reading them 30, 40 years ago, but only in the last five years did I understand how to look for something that I wondered, you know, I wondered about. Is it there? Oh, it's everywhere. I'm remembering I'm remembering a tiny poem, it's a little love poem in which he says, you know, you were, you were um, I, I decided to cut a wreath of leaves for you, a wreath. And I cut and I cut, and when I got them all cut, you weren't there. And so I put the wreath on my head. I'm, and I mean, it's, much, it's a much prettier poem than that. I'm just summarizing sort of what he, where he goes with it. But you feel as he's cutting that he's getting to something. There's something behind the leaves, someone behind the leaves. He'll make the wreath and then put it on his head, her head. But no, there is no one. And in Seferis Sefer as well, I think, where he's uh -huh. looking for the, the king, or his speaker's looking for the king of Alcini. Yeah. 
and can only touch the stone that the king, he imagines the king has touched. Right. And I've also seen it in the poetry as translated into English of Mahmud Darwish, mm. which is a part of the world that was once um, Neoplatonic, shall we say. <laughs> and I suppose in poets, English poets like George Herbert as, as, as well. Oh. To some degree. And you know, uh, Edward, Lord Herbert, the older brother who got the castle, um, mm. has a poem, a very famous poem, and it turns out, well, not famous enough, it called Black Beauty. It's a sonnet. And it's an apophat, it's a sonnet about the apophatic qualities of blackness. Oh, so it's, for thought that. That, it's thought that he had a black, quote unquote, mistress, but the po the sonnet is about how all colors are pathetically weak, except black. Black is the only color that does not disappear in the dark. That's just one of the images. Yeah, sounds it's, wonderful. It's fantastic. And, and so is John Donne's Negative Love. That's a very difficult poem, but it's, it's fantastically apophatic. But these are the outliers in English poetry. They, they're That's the ones true. who are into sort of, you know, utter independence. Hmm. Although in the Romantics, I mean, people like Wordsworth, you do get a sense of that. I think he had a, he and Dorothy must have both had a strong sense, but I think they they naturalized it as, you know, of the familiar sort of spirit of a sort of Christian universe. Yes. Um, it wasn't, it, it, there isn't sufficient strangeness when you compare mm. them to uh, Dunn or, um, or even uh, Edward Lord Herbert. Um, mm. yes, Look for I, that poem. I agree with you, yeah. Well, what's but, fun to talk about these things. But somehow it's, uh, once again, um, what I love about uh, Mandelstam's essays uh, is that you read it and uh, what, like he has such a crisp and beautiful way of expressing a thought, but then you keep reading and the thought starts sort of, uh, unwinding itself in a spiral and mm -hmm. comes to its opposite. Mm -hmm. So when you read uh, the whole uh, essay, you already, you realize that like as a whole, it might mean something absolutely different and it can mean many things at the same time. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I find it very uh, interesting that with all this, um, like in the nature of the world, that particular essay, which says that uh, Russian is Hellenic language. Of course, it coexists in Mandelstam world uh, with the poems that Reg was quoting before uh, that uh, I would like to leave my speech and go to a different speech. And that, that different speech in, in case of Mandelstam was German. So, so Mandelstam actually wanted to go to like this, well, the English is also a, a German, Germanic language. So Mandelstam would like to go back to a different room. Well, not back, but to a new room of uh, uh, poetic universe uh, mm -hmm. at the same time as back to Greece. Oh, it, is there? Yeah. It might've had to do with um... I know in Svetayev's case, it would have had to do with Rilke, and it might have had to do with Rilke for Mandelstam too, because German can be incredibly concrete like English, but it, but there is a kind of a, I don't know what to call it, a spiritual dimension, a kind of ethereal quality to uh, the pursuit of, um, of, of uh, the supernatural. I don't, I hate to call it that, that sounds uh, trivialized. Yeah. But the, the, you know, the idea that there's an eminence um, of some sort. Mm -hmm. So that would have fit Mandelstam. You know, the, the thing about the, uh, the word being flesh too, I have this other quote, I, I looked this one up too. You know, the one about Pasternak, Pasternak's poetry. He says, um, it's in the essay called The Notes on Poetry. To read Pasternak's verse is to clear your throat, to fortify your breathing, to fill your lungs. Surely such poetry could provide a cure for tuberculosis. <laughs> to read Pasternak's book, My Sister, Life, is a collection of marvelous breathing exercises. 
the, the word becomes so physicalized for him. I don't, I don't know if anyone can reconstruct the sort of sensorium of a language that's especially a dead one, like ancient Greek. But, you know, having spent a lot of time, even though I'm not a classicist, in the lexicon, I'm amazed at how many words there are for things that English never thought of making a word for. A single word. So many compound words in, in Greek, you know, I, I can't remember the word right now, but the first one I ever noticed said was a verb. And the definition was jumps when pinched. <laughs> <laughs> or leaps when pinched. So that's, wonderful. that's very physical too. Mm -hmm. I think there's a physicality and a, a kind of um, taxonomical hunger in ancient Greek that I love. I love it. Uh, and did the Greeks coin uh, words, compound words, oh, um, yeah. just a sort of, uh, um, for just occasional use and individual use? I don't know how it worked, but there are so many words which are so specific and peculiarly so that uh, every word is coined, you know, ultimately every word was coined, but these are so fantastically related to the physicality of Greek mm. love. Mm. Um, jumps when pinched. <laughs> <laughs> One word. Mm. Not, mm. not what I just said in English, which is, you know, it's complicated. When jumps, verb, when pinched. Okay. It's complicated as a thought and it's complicated in terms of language as well. Mm. Must make a complicated word. Complicated. I suppose it's a, a that's a link with German as well. Oh. Yeah. But uh, somehow maybe coming back to this thought about um, the depth of a language and ability to look back through the poem. So what I was thinking is that uh, if we're not talking about the language, but about the poetic tradition, then uh, I feel its presence in English uh, most deeply. And uh, uh, dear Carol, I was actually thinking about one of your poems that I hope you will read um, today, which um, somehow channels through the voice of Elizabeth B Bishop, um, through your voice, and how her lines are just somehow coming through your lines. You can, so I was, um, uh, would, would you like to, um, like, I, I, I would love yes, you to. Yes, I'd love to. I'd be yeah. happy to, thank you. So I, I wrote this when I was living in Belfast in a street called Moonstone Street. Mm. Um, and I just discovered Elizabeth Bishop's work uh, at that time. I hadn't read very much of her poetry uh, before that. Um, and there are various little quotations from her work, her essays and her poems are sort of woven into it. I have to say it's, it's very strongly iambic. It's, it doesn't use, it's not as experimental in, in, in rhythm. I don't think it's, it gives the quality of, of Bishop's voice exactly, or even slightly, but, but it's sort of trans, translated, I suppose, as far as I could. Um, and I called it uh, a cloud house because I was living in a place where the weather was very volatile as I do in Wales as well. Um, and I imagined her in Brazil where she talks about in her little house, the clouds actually coming, coming down from the mountains and going into the house. So that was the first connection. You loved the houses mist builds on the bay as well as smaller shells on scurrying flits Compression, lightness and agility, all rare in this loose world, and casually forsaken homes of lapsed unkillable arts to do with fish. There's not much sea this way, but once an Irish poet found amethyst and moonstone in his air, you'd glimpse them too, and like the watery naming of these streets, moonstone, capstan, larkstone, as I do. This well-worked stone is north, another reason you'd quickly feel at home as guest, as ghost, pleased by the manner, more pleased to discern a climate amiable, reserved, 
unfussed and modern. Since that autumn night when rooms swam to the stars in beaver and our streets, privileged, stunned, got thick with speculation, we've not, touch wood, heard much bad news. Our pains are loosened more by DIY or trains, blue streak expresses, shambling ochre freights. Come to the window, we have clouds again, opal and pearl with slate blue undersides, clear harebell light after a week of rain. Small hills are tucked beyond the railway line. This seepage is the evidence of their trades. The hills are shy, but the clouds are like your moose, looming, curious. They'd have tea with us and mope and float their way through every room, dousing the puzzled cactus, spelling doom to the carpets where they'd roll like exiled seas. We'll shut them out. Instead, here's your complete poems, the bookmark at insomnia, that slender glass of tears, of sorrows, almost neat, but for the salt and lime, great arts to Kia. Speaking of which, we'll share a drop some night. Not yet. We know as Puritans that we are the natural victims of the iridescent, the fun ride hard to quit once started on. Your panic muse has finer distillation. A vino nobile, slightly effervescent. Dusk's glow gets bluer, midges mob the door. They tangle sideways, whiz like particles in a cloud chamber, dance like demented stars. Are they in love? Is it sex they're celebrating? Or some dank river god under my floor? This, it appears, is a midges time of year. Or else it's you that set them off competing, frantic to win a moment of that gaze which maps the world so beautifully to scale, from peak to shack to hummingbird tiny detail. Is fixity the nub of what I'm saying? Or, at a wilder guess, posterity? Although compared with you I'm only playing at exile, I'm disturbed by fixity, yet wish there were no choice but to be fixed. This house remembers, something in it does, how, back before the plumbing climbed the stairs, eight lives, six small, two slightly bigger, mixed in a quartet of beds where one now sits. They would have been contemporaries of yours. The latest I could picture on these streets goes to church twice a week, loves twelfth parades. She sometimes still gets sent communion cards, so, named, survives this era of short lets to foreigners like me. If, one cold night, Anne Walker should come back, drawn by my light, who'd be the ghost? Whose would be the home? And what am I to you, fumbling about the sealed, transparent window of a poem? No love can let you in, nor let me out. The sky puts on her drabbest violet now. The moon sighs at her 16-hour day. But none of this can matter where you are out in space-time. You have forgotten how your gift was weighed in moonless tears of stone, and your loved houses liked to disappear into the radiant bays, the spinning ocean. The mind moves house. Even the hearts housed there are travellers. Nothing's lost, your art's to stay. You say, a shining wave fills all the sky. You say, I'm here. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. This is really, it, it ends with an epiphany. So just, um, it reminds me of uh, piece and eight of Pindar with, uh, this amazing client's um, life is a dream of a shade. And mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, so there is this um, Gr Gregory Nash's essay about um, the presence of um, a heroic um, prophet in the poem who appears directly to Pindar. And so there is this sense of dream of a shade being nothingness but then it can be dream like the shade which is dreaming all of us and mm -hmm. when you when you i heard you uh, saying 
who'd be the ghost, whose would be the home. I think it's it's a beautiful parallel to this sense of the past being gone, non-existent, but then maybe we are the ghosts, maybe, uh, maybe they're dreaming us, maybe they are the ultimate reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I've never seen a ghost, but I would be open to the offer of seeing one. <laughs> um, yeah, but the, the reference to the to the, the event in Beaver was a, was my first experience of hearing a bomb explode close close at, at hand. Perhaps I should have ex explained that. Um, uh, but uh, at, at that point in Belfast, the peace process wasn't quite underway. But I mean, there was there were the beginnings of reconciliation. And you could live, you could live in a, a leafy street, you know, quite, <laughs> quite safely um, most of the time. But I do think that idea of the of the unsayable comes into Irish, Northern Irish poetry a lot. Written that that, particularly that which was written in the seventies and eighties, um, and and you will know Seamus Heaney's famous line: "Whatever you say, say nothing." So that kind of links quite interestingly. Not with Elizabeth Bishop though. Um, but it's in, another thing that interested me about her was she, in one of her letters she said, "I'm basically a tumty tum sort of poet." But I sort of she forced herself to be, become <laughs> much more modern, and I feel I've got to that stage now. But I wasn't at that stage then. I still wanted to be a tumty tum uh, writer. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you know what I mean. The iambic pentameter. <laughs> but but speaking of tumty tum, uh, both of you. Um, so it's a question to both of you, uh, uh, Reg and Carol. Um, what um, do you find yourself inspired by any of the Tom to Tom from the ancient Greece? Well, yeah, I, I have an answer for that one. Um, you know, I I concocted a, a version of the Third Pythian Ode, um, but instead of directing it toward the tyrant of Syracuse and uh, hoping he would get well. I directed it toward the tyrant of the United States of America and told him he was irreparably ill. And um, it was very important to me to produce the shape of the entire ode, strophe, antistrophe, and epode, and all those, there's several, there's several groups of them. But since it's impossible in English to produce a metrical it's possible in English to produce a metrical analogy to the way meter shifts and changes from, from each set to the next and into the epodes, but it would be pointless because most people couldn't even pick it up. If you tried to do it, they wouldn't even notice what it was. So I created a syllabic count, oh, form based on syllabic count and the strophes and antistrophes. I used irregular lines to, uh, I used the uh, broken lines where half, you know, half the line, it, it, the second half of the line is indented and pushed out a little bit within uh, uh, and down. It's a, what's called a drop line typographically. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I used the pattern of, of the two halves of each line. Let's say, I'll just make one up. The first half was always nine syllables in strophe one and the second half was seven, let's say. And then the antistrophe would do exactly the same thing. And I followed exactly the structure of the ode. Everything that he does is in the ode that I made, but everything's been replaced by the materials and properties and objects and persons, except for the incredible luck um, that there's a character, a mythological character in that ode called Nixion, who allowed me to bring Richard Nixon into my poem as another Another uh, another one who travesties, you know, the, the sacred. Mm -hmm. So to that extent, yes, I've done the whole thing. It was published online um, at, at a magazine called atlength.com. And uh, it'll be in my next book. But I wrote it in 2017. Um, if I were writing it now, I wouldn't have the heart to do it. I mean, it's just everything is just too, too ex horribly, you know, worse. However, I did, I did enjoy following Pindar's, not just creating a, an analog, uh, a linguistic analog or a poetic analog to his structure in terms of metrical 
and stan stanza measures, but also following his train of thought. Because, you know, I, mm. I'm, I'm not a classicist, so I read Pindar in Loeb and I work everything out because I've got a trot. And so I can, I can figure that, I can figure out what I'm supposed to see there. Um, but uh, if Pindar's reputation, you know, beginning with the Romans as being uh, inscrutable and unaccountable in the way he jumps around, I don't find so hard to read in the 21st century or even in the 20th. Mm -hmm. I think actually, the, uh, I think the, I think he often leaps by association implicit associations, just the way poets do, all the way back to whatever, Anacreon or whatever. Um, and so that was, it was fun to, because of the work of having to translate it, so-called, reinvent it, I had to do the same, I had to make the same analog or analogous mental moves and emotional moves, yeah, yeah. which was fascinating to me. Um, I didn't find it a dead poem at all. Mm. And did you find syllabics uh, came naturally to you, or did did you find yourself counting a lot of the time? Counting um, syllables. I didn't. I wasn't able to learn to hear them without counting them uh, consciously. Mm -hmm. But it's it is odd. You do get into a bit of a habit. I've done a lot of syllabic lines. Most people don't even know that's what they are. I mean, most readers don't even bother to think this mm -hmm. way. Or to look at that but it, it does get to be a bit of an impulse you you sort of know you know you sort of know but then yeah, you can't be yeah. sure and then you find no no that one's that one's mm. a syllable short or a syllable long but you do you can practice it i i don't i don't mm. recommend it to anybody it's just that i wanted to reproduce the meticulousness of the yeah. structuring line by line and 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 stanza by stanza of that poem I mean, they are all of them. They're they're meticulously constrained by these conventions, and I wanted to inhabit mm. that at least to a degree. Is Pindar's form related to the chorus, the form of the of the of the chorus yeah, in Greek tragedy? Mm -hmm. It's it's another one to be yeah. It's another one to be danced and sung. These are these are in the victory ode, so yeah, they yeah. Uh, they were celebrations yeah. of somebody and and this. Um, this tyrant of Syracuse, uh, it was just like now. I mean, only kings can have stables, you know, filled with horses, <laughs> grooms, yeah. drivers, trainers, you know, and bringing in the alfalfa from the fields to feed them. So this, he was a chariot, he always entered chariots in the various games. And Pindar seems implicitly to be writing to him to say very, very nice things to him and to hope very, very much that he'll get well because Pindar could use another one of those fat purses of gold coins. And he doesn't want the guy to die before entering another, in another chariot race. That's my reading. Do you think he would have picked it up or picked up that meaning? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, he was already ill. At the, I don't really know. I don't know if anyone knows exactly what kinds of what kind of shape um, Chiron was in, but um, I don't know. Yeah. It's very flattering. It's an enormously flattering ode, but he brings in these, you know, he always brings in mythical stuff. And the myth that he mm. brings in is Nixion to say, Basically, don't do something really, really bad to those people in Syracuse because look what happened to Nixion. And don't do anything really, really bad because look what happened to Coronis, who was slain in her bed, you know, by Apollo's sister for having cheated on the god. And these were all perfect for uh, our current autocrat. Yeah. yeah. They're perfect. Brilliant. You know, yes. So. But but maybe Reg, if Reg would would you like to read at least an excerpt to, to give us a sense of uh, how it goes? All right, I'll read you the first. Uh, I'll read you the first stanza, I guess. But um, no, let me read you one of the really nasty ones. Uh, well, maybe it's Pinder with a uh, 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 sort of Pinder in an Archilochian way, rather. Yes, uh, right. So let me go a little further because 
Uh, Pindar also points out that um, Asclepius was was executed by Zeus because he raised somebody from the dead. I mean, you can't go out and try to do everything. You, you offend the order of things. And uh, he mentions that Cadmus was punished, you know. Um, let me see. Let's see. Here's a little passage. Here's Nixion. Now you live, this is Antistrophe 5, now you live in auto-inflamed blithering and TV. Nixion, a devious man like you, willfully schemed, flouted laws, and set out to smash his enemies with his power. Hot-tongued, a bold liar, exploiting white race hate, Nixion was, however, far more patriotic than you and your malevolent pals. When you shrug, you blight, you wreck, you corrupt, you laze, you'll sell out anyone, anything. You slither away, yet you can't help leaping back to your crimes, slurs, and whining. You sneer, jeer, deny, belittle, you destroy the state, you hide bribes inside frauds, inside thefts. Zeus bound Nixion on a fire wheel spinning forever. That's one stanza. Um, well, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> I'm just following what Pindar does, but I'm, of course, elaborating, mm -hmm. intensifying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they all have beautiful passages in them, but this one is. Uh, more malleable than the others, you know, in this in the sense that I was that occurred to me. Hmm. And, and it's going to be published next year, you say, in your the in book a collection. Will be next year, it's online. That poem at at this site called uh, it's a it's a website. It's a web magazine for long poems called at length. Oh, okay. You would enjoy at length. That's mm. yeah. fine. Well, there's another quote from uh, this. I, I can't resist adding one more quote from Mandelstam. <clears throat> he be, he believed in some sort of iconicity in the in the word, you know, uh, iconicity of the image, especially. He says there's essentially no difference between a word and an image. An image is merely a word which has been sealed up, which cannot be touched. An image is inappropriate for everyday use, just as an icon lamp would be inappropriate for lighting a cigarette. I love that. There's something there, even in English, there's, there's some meaning there that's very interesting. And it's the opposite of imagism in a way. It is. An well, opposite of, of that theory. Yeah, although maybe imagism is just uh, as, as, as pleasing to the mind's eye and, and senses, all of them, as it is, and as wonderfully compact as some of that work is, which was what makes it exciting to read, um, maybe imagism itself is actually, was a failed attempt to go just a little bit further, somehow to sort of iconicize um, the key images a bit more. I don't know how that would work. And I don't think one would have to be religious uh, or, or a believer to do that sort of thing with language, but I'm not sure how it would work. You know, Ilya Kutik mm. has pointed out to me, he said this to me several times, can you imagine what Pound and Elliot and the others would have done if they had known anything, anything about their Russian contemporaries? It would have opened huge vistas for them linguistically and poetically beyond what they were already creating, which is dazzling, just dazzling. But they apparently, as far as he knows, they, they never knew anything about Pasternak or, or even Akhmatova. Right, that's interesting. Yeah. Whereas the Russian writers were very tuned into avant-garde in Europe. Mm -hmm. Well, Ryuki essentially was the sword uh point of the love triangle between Tsvetaev and Pasternak. It was this mutual. Uh, yes, I've read those mm. letters. I've read that book in English. So, well, but but maybe we are getting um. So unfortunately, 
closer to the end uh, of this conversation and we still um uh, so there is still more uh to to include more poetry to read and i was thinking that um carol so you also have your own mandelstam uh so we have heard um Regis Mandelstam and by the way those lines were also those were also syllabic uh yes. lines all of them oh right they're all five yes. syllables yes amazingly uh, and it took me quite a, a long time to know it is that and to like, realize oh. yes but that's a sign of a, a strong poem i think that you, where you don't actually start counting syllables although marianne moore is an, is proves the opposite of that because <laughs> you are very aware of her syllables and, and yet she's a wonderful poet yeah yes but 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 carol how about um maybe like i know that uh i hope there are more poems that you could read for us perhaps to bring us to conclusion to this conversation which i actually don't at all uh want to conclude but uh um maybe the mandelstam poem i will yes i'm happy to do that one you you could say it for us in in russian maybe as well could you oh, of course yes i that, it, that would be wonderful uh, oh well, this would be my joy let me pull uh out the russian text uh i'm sorry to get to, but no, you can no. do it easily yeah no, I think it's uh, somehow I would like to, you know, put on the spot for nothing better than for this. So <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm ready, but um, so should uh, should Russian go first or English go first? English should go first to people who don't speak any Russian, because then they can pick up a little bit more oh. from the from the Russian. So, so shall I start then? So it's a poem from, from Stone, uh, Carmen, his uh, first collection, which was published in 1913, and all the poems are set in St. Petersburg. So I've just called it Poem from Stone. We'll die in crystalline Petropolis, whose ruling deity is Proserpina. We swallow deadly air with every breath, and every hour becomes a year of death. Goddess of oceans, terrible Athena, resign your helmet, stone magnificence. We'll die in crystalline Petropolis, which is not ruled by you, but Proserpina. Beautiful. It's absolutely magic. Uh, so I, uh, how both the, how English, so there is always this difficult choice for the translator what to do, go with the sense or the sound. And I I am absolutely stunned how in this case you somehow retain both. So it is really the word which has uh, remaining whole, both the meaning and the sound. So it's- Could I, could I ask? Could I ask, it's short, could I ask Carol to read it once more? I would love to hear it a second time. And then, and then hear the Russian. Yes, I'm happy to do that if, if, this, if, if, the, if this time. Yes, yes. Poem from Stone. We'll die in crystalline Petropolis, whose ruling deity is Proserpina. We swallow deadly air with every breath and every hour becomes a year of death. Goddess of oceans, terrible Athena, resign your helmet stone magnificence. We'll die in crystalline Petropolis, which is not ruled by you, but Proserpina. Thank you. I can do the Russian now. Great. В Петрополе прозрачно мы умрем, где властвует над нами Прозерпина. Мы в каждом вздохе смертный воздух пьем, и каждый час нам смертная година. Богиня моря, грозная Афина, сними могучий каменный шелом. В Петрополе прозрачном мы умрем. Здесь царствуешь не ты, а Прозерпина. Mm. Thank you. 
and then of course this brings us back to uh, Persephone in uh, Regis' poem and uh, to this whole sense of um, well, who is like Persephone is probably like the most apophatic figure ever, who is mm -hmm. so absent uh, and so crucially present when she's yeah. present. Yes, we miss her so much when she's not around. <laughs> yes. But so, so maybe should we uh, conclude this for with some prayers? Oh, yes, sure. This time still, yeah. Um, so I've imagined Zeus as, as, a, as a god um, against climate change, not really the god of climate change, but a god um, perhaps who might at least be fighting against it. So that's the first prayer. Then there's a little prayer to the muses. And I stopped writing for a while when I was suffering from a lot of anxiety. And I found I actually could overcome that if I could overcome the silence of not, write, of not writing and start writing again and thinking about nature and sort of meditating in an informal way. And then the last poem is to poetry um, itself. So to Zeus, great climate shifter God who sees the farthest, don't be rough when you make love to our earth. She returns the furious kisses of your lightning, fearing for her life. And when you strip the sky to display the bruises we ourselves inflicted, believe the remorse of those who thought they were gods. You also, Epistemi, Techni, aid us in our poor scattered acts of reparation. O Zeus, withdraw into your royal blue smile. Spare us the vertical rain, your storm of pity. To the Muses. Children of Zeus, I will never again forget you. In your absence, there was no air. Even my dreams were choked with trains and lost tickets. Dance back, endorphin muses. I cover my high-risk promise with this prayer. And finally, to poetry. My darkest eye, the one I've never seen in any glass, changes the day with you, colouring bridally, though out of season, like hills in sudden scarves of frost or bracken. It knows your fiercest winter hex, but stays patient, snow-lidded, meeting dark with dark. It loves the rose-bright pulse of you in health. Its fame runs to your heart, picks up the song. It sees you best when everyday eyes sleep. But should these daily eyes lose sight of you, the meanest light will never meet my road. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. Mm. Has that one been published? Uh, yes, it was in a, I think two, uh, two or three collections ago. It was in oh. maybe a, a book called Blind Spots, but I can't quite remember. Our library is about to open again. Oh, brilliant. You're, I wish ours was. <laughs> and I will go find it. So, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, please, please, Carol, sorry for interrupting. I was just going to say I'd be happy to send you a copy, and I wish we were here in, in person, and then I could ask Reginald to sign his book, which I've, in the last collection, which uh -huh. is magnificent, and I've enjoyed it so much. Well, and to hear it was wonderful as well, to hear poems thank from you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to see, if you want to send me the poem by email, that would be lovely. Yeah, too. okay. I will, go, okay. I will go find the book. What a uh, lovely way to conclude. Uh, and I think our current situations that we're all talking in this virtual reality, it also um, just um, somehow connects to the presence and the absence. And I should say is that, of course, you are painfully absent. Uh, I cannot, um, well, uh, I, I am so far away from the, well, from Chicago and uh, Wales, but in this conversation, it is definitely the presence that uh, wins over. And uh, it has been a thrilling intellectual and emotional and poetic adventure to take part in. I'm, so grateful to both of you, Reginald Gibbons and Carol Romans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all of you. Well.
Okay, and thank you so much, everybody who were listening to us. It, it is a joy to share uh, the conversation with this amazing poet. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.